It's the same hustle, it's the same thing Same tears on the we face Maybe one day we will see We're one big family Like it's one channel It's the same sunshine, it's the same rain The same struggle just to maintain Maybe one day we will see We're one big family Like it's one channel Welcome back to Discussions with Indigenous Education, the genocide of the dark-skinned Indian. We are talking about organization with respects to the stages of genocide. And right now, we are reviewing what the United States did with respects to Indian agents. And if you don't mind, I'd just like for you to read the uh, statement one more time before we start to get into some of the particulars. Okay. Um, that he, the said McGillivray, had received a letter from the American commissioners of the treaty at, and we believe it is Seneca, which informed him that the Americans had 15,000 men ready to come to the Creek land and that they were not coming to hurt them but to make them tame, and that they Americans desired him to have a good many of the tame women ready for them that they might incorporate with them and beget a tame breed of people. All right, and this, this is a quote from uh, an individual named Abner Hammond. Correct? Hammond, Hammond. Hammond, all right. And so, you know, I want to get into this just a little bit because... Now again, now the statement mm -hmm. is what he, this is Abner Hammond, Writing, writing what he heard. What he heard McGillivray Mc say. All yes. right, and McGillivray, <laughs> right? But before I even ask, uh, let's before we talk about McGillivray. Um, matter of fact, l let's talk about McGillivray first because they talking about tamed women. They talking about fifteen. M let me let me just ask one question before we talk about McGillivray, right? F they have fifteen thousand men that's ready that's that's looking for tamed women, right? Is that if, if is that not a declaration of war? Like if you come, if, you, if I hear that it's fifteen thousand soldiers about to come from New York to Georgia and they looking for women, and for me to have the group of women that they would find tamed <laughs> is the term that I'm going to use, right? Who is the term that they use? That they, <laughs> ready so that we might what they what was this uh, um, beget? a tame breed. So they want a tamer breed. They want a tamer breed <laughs> than the tame right. one that they already have. <laughs> again, we're talking about, so now, again, now, I, and I just want, what happens when you mix? And, and, and who were these initial tamed? Tamed women, right? And, and you know, um, the reality of it, you know, as, as far as indigenous populations is concerned, is that the women that were biracial were placed to the side and held t to be for, for the European men right. more often than not. Because they were a little more civilized. Mm, oh, really? Is that what that was? <laughs> is it civilized? Is it lighter skinned? You know, what I mean? is it more uh, 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 that they are blending into the American society? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And, and, and so, you know, and were they ever successful at creating this tame breed of people? That's, we, we're going to continue to talk about <laughs> that, right? And so, you know, let's talk about McGillivray, right? Because this is too much. This is very racist, very <laughs> patriarchal, very misogynistic. And as an indigenous individual, you come and tell me that I'm thinking we at war. <laughs> you know, but let's talk about McGillivray because McGillivray is the person that's actually supposed to be giving this, you know, and the first thing I like to acknowledge <laughs> that I just consider is, wait a minute, the chief of the creek is in New York, right? That's a long way for so-called, you know, indigenous peoples and Indians to travel. They never talk about Indians traveling that far with respect to conducting business. You know? Oh well, after the establish of the United, after the establishment of the United States, mm -hmm. oh, Philadelphia became a hub of activity mm -hmm. because all these Indian tribes now are, are realizing what is going on 
and they want a little piece of this pie. Yeah, you so know, I wonder if that Seneca heard Anthony Hamilton talking about the 15,000 men going south in the bar. You mean Andrew? Well, what? Anthony Hamilton, you know, Andrew Hamilton, whatever the ball name is. <laughs> <laughs> Not Anthony Hamilton, yeah, right? No, right. <laughs> <laughs> Not the singer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Andrew Hamilton, you know what I mean? Because that's what they did. They met well, at Alexander, bars. No, and, really, it's Alexander Hamilton. I'm yeah. sorry, because Andrew Hamilton was the gentleman that was in Philadelphia. Right, okay, right. <laughs> but the, you know, the point is all this business was being handled in <laughs> bars, for real, for real, while the people was drinking and they trying to figure it out because this is the organizing of it. And let's talk about McGillivray, who he was, his background. And, you know, again, you told me that he's, he's a chief. Right, but he's yes. speaking English, you know. Okay, and also his name was McGillivray. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, okay, so uh, his name was Alexander McGillivray. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, he, his, his, he was considered, and, and I hate saying this, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. but he was considered one quarter Indian. Okay. 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 Uh, so his, his mother was considered half Greek. Um, and his father was a Scottish tradesman. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, But he probably was lighter skinned and allowed to be a Native American because he had lighter skin, you know, but we, go ahead, excuse well, me. Well, yeah, well, see, uh, <laughs> and really, even by definition, you know, this terminology, you know, the American Indian was starting to turn red when, you know, when mm. uh, that terminology wasn't even used for Indians for, for over 200 years. And so now you have this new terminology because you now you have this, this, this more tame looking breed yes. of, of, <laughs> of a Native Americans that they would like to promote, right? Yes. I mean, it is what it is. You know, <laughs> right. This is yes. the history. Yeah, so uh, because he was, uh, uh, he was close by to European teachings, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, his father made sure mm -hmm. that he was schooled, and so he had the knowledge of the English language, mm -hmm. and he could speak it very well. So he, he, he represented the tribe. Now, <laughs> the, 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 co the colonizers were calling him chief because he was the one that was coming and negotiating with the colonizers, okay. Uh, however, most of the time what they would do is because they would send it, the, the tribes would send an English speaking person. However, um, they were not the chief themselves. They would have to bring the information back to the tribes mm -hmm. and then the tribe would decide on what they would do. Okay. You know, so really they were just sent as a negotiator, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> But McGillivray, he was really pretty smart because he realized that the British government was not the only government that was here doing business. Mm, mm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So after he got finished making deals with the United States government, and as a matter of fact, the United States government, after one deal that he made, they made him a brigadier general mm. of the United States Army, oh. where he received a pension for the rest of his life. Yeah, okay. I wonder how his people felt about that. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> but because he was a shrewd operator, the, the tribe trusted him because he not only dealt with the United States government, he was going down into Florida and he was dealing with the Spanish government th there. He was dealing with the French. So he, he was really trying to make whatever deal he could for, for his people. And so that is one thing that I can say that, that About he did. McGillivray, right. Even but, though. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say. <laughs> Go ahead, even though. <laughs> even though he made a heck of a lot of money, mm, you mm -hmm. know, became quite rich. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And gave up a lot of his people's land, land yes. in the process. Yes. You know, and again... But they felt that he had to do that so that they could survive. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he wasn't necessarily then uh, wholeheartedly selfish, you know, um, based on historical notes. Him, more than probably most of the other Indian agents, were actually considering his people a little bit more often than not, mm -hmm. you know, based on history, right? And so um, it's actually time for us to 
uh, wrap this show up, right? We're getting to the end. There's so much to talk about. I don't want to stop in the middle, you know, and have them. And so we're going to stop here. And when we get back, we're going to start getting into um, the United States Indian agents and land, right? Because now it's a few years later and we need to start talking about how the United States organize itself in order to achieve the end goal of getting the land. And so um, I think that we've starting to really get into this now. It's a lot, it's a lot of- It's a lot. It's a lot, right? I think we went over three to five years in this episode from 1776 to about 1788 to 1790. And so we're gonna be picking up from there in the next show. Red Silver Fox, also known as Renee Sanders. I'm your co-host, Tyra Sanders, also known as Red Tail Hawk. And we hope to see you next time on Discussions with Indigenous Education, the Genocide of the Dark Skin Indian. Peace. Peace. It's the same hustle, it's the same day. Same tears on the replay. Maybe one day we will see. We're one big family, like it's one.